Okay, thanks, Julian, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Film reviews, by which we mean extended discussion and evaluation of films in general release performed by named film critics, became a notable and enduring feature of newspapers and magazines, newspapers and general interest magazines in English-speaking countries from the early to mid-1930s. Well, some notable exceptions with some notable exceptions, written discourse on film prior to the arrival of sound was dominated by newspaper and magazine film columns. These film columns, often published on a weekly basis, provided varied coverage of the cinema during the silent and transition to sound periods. And what you see on the screen now could be found in publications across the English-speaking world. Most newspaper and magazine film columnists undertook film criticism only intermittently if at all, as part of their repertoire of journalistic cinematic coverage. For instance, Australian newspaper and magazine film columns provided extensive coverage of cinema before the early 1930s, indeed from the late 1910s, but this coverage provided critical engagement only occasionally. In this column-driven environment, reviews, when present, were modest undertakings. They routinely consisted, as they do in this slide, of short capsule summaries of the film's plot, identifying the performer and type of film. Indeed, the Melbourne-based table talk was unusual in that its summaries provided by film were provided by film rather than by Melbourne cinemas. Um, actually, they only started to do that by mid-1926, and this was one of the most discursive of the ways in which you'd approach something which you'd say looked like a kind of film review. But by the early to mid-1930s, a more fully-fledged extended review format had emerged and was adopted by a considerable number of newspapers and magazines across the English-speaking world. This review format combined film criticism that had been present in the most astute film columns with both the snapshot information characteristic of the capsule review and the film guide characteristic of the trade press's film review. The former had developed as an extension of available literary journalists' aesthetic vocabulary of evaluation, sense-making and description for negotiating aesthetic and part aesthetic works, such as novels, poetry, plays, fine arts in news media, while the trade review had developed from the late teens and early 20s to estimate a film's box office potential and exploitation value for independent exhibitors. The new extended film review format of the 1930s gave film coverage a distinct self-contained and purpose of form as a film by film guide. They also, and this was by no means universal, drew on the development of film criticism in adjacent books, specialist publication and emergent, emerging film societies from the mid-20s establishment of the London Film Society that prioritised cinema as a distinct cultural form. The first two of these cell sources, literary journalism, and trade reviewing were essential to the formation of the extended review. The third, though more dear to myself, and no doubt this audience, was more optional. In taking this more stable, consistent and predictable rhetorical form, film criticism became more widely practised in newspapers and magazines, acquiring a new reach and centrality to public life. In this paper, we argue, it's a joint paper with Hugh Wormsley Evans, that the normalisation of extended film reviews in general interest journalism was very much a consequence of the new institutional configurations associated with the sound cinema, as newspapers and magazines recalibrated their relationship to sound cinema's new status as a self contained and distinct cultural form. Let's be clear. An extended discussion and occasional evaluation of individual films in release certainly existed before the 1930s as part of the voluminous, and I do mean voluminous, print and later broadcasting response to the silent cinema as a central facet of public life. Hello, Adrian. <laughs> Anna Everett, for instance, has charted a continuous and impressive strand of black film criticism in the US black press from the turn of the 20th century in her returning the gaze. Richard Abel has shown in Menus for Movie Land how newspaper coverage and women film columnists contributed to the emergence of a national film culture in the US in the teens of the 20th century. Even a form of film reviewing as we understand it now was intermittently present in newspapers and magazines throughout the silent and transition to sound period. My best exhibit. 
The Pulitzer Prize winning poet and biographer Carl Sandburg, for instance, fashioned film reviews in a critical communication format for the Chicago Daily Mail between 1920 and 1928. Sandburg drew on the readily available availability of a vocabulary of narrative, performance and visualisation provided by adjacent literary, theatre and art criticism fields to which he contributed in no small measure. The same can be said of Iris Barry and C.A. Lejeune's, Carolyn Alice Lejeune's silent film columns, which could at times be substantial works of film criticism in their own right, occasionally taking the form of a film review of a particular film. This is why Barry Lejeune and their colleague Walter Mort Mycroft are seen as innovating film criticism in the UK during the 1920s. But it was the film reviewers of the 30s and 40s who forged formidable national and international reputations. Among these were Graham Greene, C.A. Lejeune, of course, and Alastair Cook, also the BBC's first radio film critic. In the UK and in the, in, in the UK, Green, Lejeune and Cook in the UK, and Otis Ferguson, James O.G., Manny Farber and Parker Tyler in the US, you see on the screen. Of these, only Lejeune had been a silent film critic. Smaller nations like Australia produced their own versions. One of Australia's foremost literary journalists, Kenneth Slesser, worked as a film critic over the 1930s for the Australasian newspaper Smith's Weekly. Beatrice Tildesley was the Australian Women's Weekly's first film critic, and Earl Cox, under the nom de plume of the Shield, was the Argus and the Australasians film critic throughout the 1930s, and these were the main film critics in Australia of this period. The importance of these 1930s and 40s reviews to the development of the review format is highlighted by the number of anthologies published of critics' work from the period. This process began with Carolyn Lejeune's Chestnuts in Her Lap in 1946, covering the previous decade of her film reviewing, followed by the Carolyn Lejeune Reader in 1991, and then we see James Adgie's posthumous Adgie on Film in 1958, republished again in 2005, and publications of reviews of Ferguson and Faber in 1971. Green in 1972 and 1975, and finally Cook in 2011. Compiled anything from less than a decade to as much as 80 plus years from first publication, these film review anthologies attest to these 1930s and 40s film, reviewings, uh, film reviewing having enduring public appeal and literary value as letters. This was literary journalism in the double sense of writing of lasting literary value and arts journalism of continuing significance extending well beyond the objects attended to, the films reviewed and the dated and day circumstances of first publication. Film reviews here not only provided readers with a substitute for film viewing but also attracted a readership not particularly interested in the cinema. W.H. Auden's, um, uh, w. H. Auden saw um, Adji's reviews for the highbrow liberal weekly The Nation as, quote, the most remarkable event in American journalism today, belonging to, quote, that select class of newspaper work which is permanent literary value. Like the theatre reviewing of George Bernard Shaw and the later reviewing of Kenneth Tynan, such film criticism had its own intrinsic value as prose literature. Board will see these newspaper and general interest magazines critics as having raised the quality of popular film commentary by highlighting the aesthetics and artfulness of the Hollywood studio cinema. He shows that each focused on a particular feature of this cinema. In Ferguson's case, fluent storytelling methods. In Adji's case, poignant expression. In Faber's case, unassuming pictorial intelligence. And in Tyler's case, cracks opening onto myth, black magic and sexual fantasy. By contrast, silent cinema and transition to sound film columns came in a much less modular, contained form of more dispersed. Their wide coverage of topics and individual films were made more contextually bound to the circumstances of their day and date film release, even when they were substantial works of film criticism. This might explain, this is uh, on your, on your uh, screen there, is uh, Punch, a Melbourne-based publication which uh, folded in around about 1926 but had been published for the previous 50 or 60 years, um, for which, in fact, uh, Kenneth Slesser uh, wrote in his one period he spent in Melbourne. <laughs> 
Their wide coverage of topics and individual films were much more contextually bound to the circumstances of the film's release. This might explain why anthologies of film criticism, with some notable exceptions, tend to start with sound film critics. There was a discernible take-up in newspapers and magazines of the critical form through the film re review around the time of the coming of sound, and this practice extended well beyond the reviews of the exemplary canonical film critics we've just mentioned. But why did this take up coincide with the consolidation of the sound cinema and why didn't it occur earlier? Notwithstanding the legacies of forgetfulness about aspects of the silent cinema and its achievements that has only recently been re remedied, it's still surprising that such reviewing was not more widely and firmly applied to cinema, newspaper and magazine film writing. Reviewing, after all, had long been a feature of literary criticism in the shape of book reviewing and theatre and art reviews had also been sufficiently established in newspapers and magazines to serve as exemplars. So, what we see here is some examples of, um, of a contemporary trawl by The Guardian back through their archives to find those elements of Lejeune's film reviewing that are most registrable to a contemporary audience. And when you look at the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, you'll see that it is a review. And it's an extended review essay of, the, of that film. At the same time, you see alongside it one of her notable pieces from 1926 about the kind of the ways in which women are treated as viewers by the trade and it, by implication by newspapers and the press generally. So, I mean, what we see here are, are, are two examples of Lejeune's film, review, film writing which points to some of the, 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 the scope which she covered in her film writing in the silent period. And um, this, is, this is the person who, right up until um, every year, Hitchcock was in America, he would send Carolyn Lejeune on Christmas uh, a, a pack of little champagne bottles. You know those little mini champagne bottles? She resigned as a film reviewer with Psycho. She couldn't understand how Kitchcock should have made such an abomination of a film. <laughs> OK. Now, one explanation for the absence is to see the consequence of cinema's low cultural standing as an art form. And there's some evidence for this. Harold Ross, as editor of The New Yorker, um, met Ninnally Johnson's proposal that he contribute a film review with Movies are for old ladies and fairies. <laughs> you can see traces of that with, uh, I included that because of the, the uh, slide of, of Lejeune's there. Um, there was also wide resistance towards film criticism and therefore film take being taken seriously in the 1920s and 30s that Iris Barry took to task in her 1926 book, Let's Go to the Pictures, and Gilbert Selders in his Seven Lively Arts. Once cinema in the broader culture has become deemed a cultural form worthy of such consideration, the extended film review found its natural home in newspapers and periodically, periodicals, particularly quality newspapers and magazines. Now that's the dominant account. But how did this reconsideration come about if not through the medium for noting, archiving and deliberating the cinema, that is, print? David Bordwell provides one explanation in his Rhapsodies. The Hollywood cinema was established as a valid popular art in the late 1930s and 40s through the work of critics, such as Ferguson, Adji, Tyler and Farber. Others looked to the steady stream of books, the advent of specialist film publications and film societies establishing these understandings from the late 1920s. But another more compelling explanation for the delayed rollout of film reviewing is provided by contemporary scholarship on the silent film and its circumstances of screening and public uptake in cinema and newspapers and periodicals. When we look at silent forms of film writing and responding to the cinema, we typically find a mixed format consisting of film comment and a film roundup, rather than an explicit and consistently developed film review format. Now, we need to read and value these silent forms of attention and criticism in terms of the relation to the cinema itself. They are a print response to the particularities of silent cinema as a social, cultural and economic institution. Recent revisions to our understanding of silent cinema's film history point to its intrinsic variability across time and space. 
While the film review view, view reels and publicity for films provided some consistency to the filmic text and its paratext, the character of cin silent cinema's live performance presence or absence varied from screening to screening, theatre to theatre, city to city and region to region. Compared to sound cinema's self-contained and standardised product, the silent cinema offered its audiences a semi-finished product, the film, which was completed by variable live performance in accompaniment and regular stage acts. With cinema chains establishing their own vaudeville circuits to accompany film exhibition, silent film screenings jostled with signature cinema stage acts, music and orchestras, film narrators, film prologues, dancing troupes, sing-alongs and talent co contests. Film accompaniments could also take different structural forms. While musical accompaniment of films during their screening was the norm, Trevor Griffiths has shown how in Aberdeen in Scotland, actors, actors voicing the, fi the film as elocutionists were a standard feature of film screenings until as late as 1926. The silent cinema, therefore, existed in two economies. One centred around the film reel and its projection and distribution, and the other centred on locally managed live performance. As Donald Crafton observed, this had the consequence that some audiences were going to the cinema as much to, quote, participate in several locally specialised forms of entertainment as to see a film. Musical accompaniment of films provided some consistency, of course, in the face of the intrinsic variability that characterised other program elements. But Rick, Al Al Rick Altman contends that the ideal of film music as, quote, carefully selected, artistically played, continuous musical accompaniment had been firmly established by 1910 and become a widely practised norm by the early 1920s. But this integration of the musical accompaniment with the film was not conceived as part of its original production. Rather, it was a post hoc reaction to the film, as Altman points out. Musicians and effects specialists all needed to critically appraise and interpret the film to formulate their musical accompaniment. Musical compilations of, of light classical music school, scores certainly helped geographically dispersed actors, meaning musicians, to roughly stabilise this accompaniment by pointing to the appropriate application of music to films. This system, however, still left scope for significant variation and interpretation with, quote, ragtime, various ethnic traditions and popular songs being part of a musical film accompaniment outside the larger US circuits, cities in the East Coast. With great variation in films, oral and live accompaniments, all performing separately as part of the cinema event, such uneven and varied combinations introduce great unevenness into film, review, in film viewing. A narrator, for instance, might undermine the preferred reading of the film pro promoted by its producers and marketers. An inappropriate or distracting music accompaniment might change the orientation of the audience to the film. A flash prologue might convince one audience of a film's quality, while the absence of such a prologue might see the film struggle in more general release without such backing. And a good elocutionist might see the film struggle in more general release without such backing. And a good elocutionist, lecturer or resident musical ensemble could become the centre of attention, not the film itself. That these accompaniments and stage show matters was always evident. In the piece you see on the screen, it's a humorous piece on film criticism from the American cinematographer in his December 1921 issue, with the regular column of Jimmy the assistant alluding to the particular problems created by such varied circumstances of screening for the reliability of film reviewers in newspapers. The film could only be critiqued in terms of the one component of the overall performance that changed the least, the screening component. But even here there was some variety as exhibition in the silent period was much looser than it would later become with sound's requirement for uniform projection and screening conditions. Exhibitors, for instance, stretched out a film's running time by varying the speed of the projector. There was much more local editing of films than there would be later and the films themselves were more variable, and the film theatres themselves were more variable in their design, projection, stage and sound environments than they would later become. In the face of these local contingencies, a countervailing effort was of course made by exhibitors and distributors to bracket out the film form from these changing accompaniments by foregrounding the film in and of itself. And the film trade assiduously promoted its performers, its stories and its filming. For their part, newspapers and periodicals took up the trade's lead, zeroing in on the most consistent element to film presentation, 
By contrast, the intensely local, variable and contingent nature of the live performance component made it less newsworthy. It was cast as low esteem and ephemeral and tributary phenomenon, in Altman's words. In larger cities, however, where these live performance components could be very significant to the experience of a film seasons, newspaper editors faced a dilemma in their coverage. They simply could not ignore live performance components, as could, say, a national newspaper such as the Daily Mail, for which Iris Barry wrote. The Chicago Daily News resolved the difficulties this created by having Carl Sandburg concentrate on the filmic part of the regular picture show program and assigning another reporter to cover the stage shows, vaudeville acts and orchestras that were also part of the weekly program. Newspapers and magazines took on a role that the cinema could not do it all well by itself, that of noting, parlaying, publicising and archiving the cinema into stories, digest, notice, titbits, gossip, publicity and posters. In this and other ways, the newspaper shaped the cinema. So, I, among a number of... Among the broader cohort of newspaper and periodical film writers of this period, a number became professionalised in the 1920s as dedicated film critics. As noted above, we can find amongst this group isolated examples of the kind of film reviewing that would become the norm in the mid-1930s. However, more, typical, more typically, these designated film critics, such as Iris Barry, who you see on screen, provided critical perspectives through the film column rather than the film review format. They did not, for the most part, follow Sandberg's example and write individual film reviews until the mid-30s. Instead, these film critics discussed individual titles only occasionally as part of a much larger remit. And this pattern can be seen in the film columns of Barry, Lejeune and Walter Mycroft. The extended film review became a more compelling proposition for newspapers and magazines, for magazine editors after the sound film stabilised the oral components of performance into a soundtrack, eliminated for the most part the live performance component and reduced consistently the differences between revenues and their film screenings. Now alongside this film criticism in newspapers and periodicals, there was, um, beginning in 1916 and certainly uh, coming to prominence by the mid to late 1920s, uh, and in the English language and beyond, a steady stream of cinema books, beginning with Vachel Lindy's the, Lindsay's The Art of the Moving Picture and Munsterberg's The Photoplay, Psychological Study, advancing the case for cinema as a distinct cultural form. These diverse books helped establish a film language and critical vocabulary for film appreciation and provided critical estimations of films and filmmakers. In addition to books by newspaper film critics, Barry with Let's Go to the Pictures in 1926 and Lejeune with the Cinema in 1930, there was Gilbert Selder's much printed The Seven Lively Arts in 1924. And he's regarded by Michael Kamen, for instance, as one of the earliest serious film critics, notably proposing that the movies as well as comic strips, and this is for you, Angela, Musical comedy, vaudeville, radio, popular music and dance had their own particular aesthetic interest as popular art. In addition to these books, there was a flurry of books published during the transition to sound, including most notably Paul Rother's authoritative film Till Now, which established film as having a notable international history, and Rudolf Arnheim's Philosophy of the Silent Film, Film as Art, 1932, translated 1933 into English, which placed the cinema at the heart of larger aesthetic concerns. What silent film theorists like Arnheim and Lindsay, film critics like Barry, Sandberg, Lejeune and Mycroft, and film historians like Rotha did was to foreground one, albeit prominent, side of this hybrid film live performance equation. As film critics, they were used to bracketing out sounds. They focused on the one constant in the film exhibition of the silent period, the film itself. Consequently, they exalted a cinema of images. Unsurprisingly, the sound film was derided by Rother as a cacophonous omnipresence in his 1930 edition of his book. With so much flux and uncertainty accompanying the transition to sound and with the unevenness of the initial part sound films and their static studio-based me methods and aesthetic, films were more like tests than texts. Rother, Arnheim and Arnheim, together with a host of writers emerging in specialist film magazines such as Close Up and Experimental Cinema, unsurprisingly saw the cinemas having achieved its most extended elaboration as an aesthetic form with the sound film. 
cinema. Now, I'm just going to show, this is, uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit here in a couple of slides. First of close up, which, uh, which is established in the late silent period and goes through to the, uh, about 1933, 34. And uh, an experimental cinema, which is which is uh, published out of Philadelphia, um, and you can see from it principles of a new world cinema, and that little um, thing about who are the people they're going to have writing for it, and the directors writing for it. We, we can see that it's setting up a kind of a, a notion of it, and, and an identification of the film journal as something that is providing a missing beat to what is being provided into into the commercial mainstream fare. These, um, these journals are associated with the development of film societies, and the most prominent and long-standing of these film societies was actually the Edinburgh Film Guild, which later gave rise to the Edinburgh Documentary Festival. Um, and this is the journal that they published for, um, for about three or four years, Cinema Quarterly, um, in, and again, it's, a, it's very much associated with, unsurprisingly, promoting the documentary form, and uh, Grierson is one of the people who writes for it, again, unsurprisingly. That's Cecil Beaton's uh, portrait at the National Portrait Gallery of uh, C.A. Lejeune, uh, apparently writing her film reviews. <laughs> now, as we can see, this silent to transition sound period provided a number of preconditions that allowed the subsequent normalisation of the practice of film reviewing as critical communication. Film criticism was becoming a regular professional position in a wide number of newspapers and magazines. A vocabulary of film analysis, description and evaluation was being improvised. The principle of independent commentary and review had been established. There were experiments with film writing in the film review format and in film columns that the extended film review <coughs> format, once settled, could draw upon and additional forums for both an aesthetic and wider public interest in film had been established outside the trade and newspapers' immediate influence with the development of for film societies, albeit in a small way, and specialist film publications. Consequently, what had been a tentative and marginal practice of extended film review became, in the circumstances of both the new sound film and newspaper and periodic publishing, a more widely practised and central undertaking. Various publications made such reviewing a centrepiece in their response to the New Sound Cinema. These ranged from the Populist, Australian Smith's Weekly, to the Middlebrow UK Observer that Lejeune would go on to write for, to the more intellectual and highbrow nation that Agi would write for. The principal business of this film criticism and film review was the sound cinema. Its near exclusive focus was upon the increasing number of higher budgeted studio films often screened in spaces not only rewired but rebuilt for sound. Now, I don't know, so I've gone too far. While Arnheim, Roth and others denigrated the sound cinema, the public response and the general critical response in newspapers to sound was favourable. As Donald Crafton observed, film goers abandoned with few regrets a cherished form of entertainment and acted as if they'd been long dissatisfied with it, seeing the sound film as an improvement. For Lejeune, in her 1928 Year in Retrospect column, the talkies had carried the cinema a, quote, a definite step towards perfect mechanisation and an age of pace and economy that that step will not be retraced. Even within the specialist film magazines, there was an enthusiasm for the possibility created by the sound film. Writing for a variety of small circulation film publications, including experimental cinema, Harry Potamkin welcomed the encroachment of sound, predicting a compound cinema which would, quote, fulfil aspirations of many 20th century artists for a form containing multiple heterogeneous elements. For their part, Newspaper and periodical publications picked up and exploited this public interest and enthusiasm for the sound film. They devoted considerable column inches to its rollout, and they celebrated the transformation it had wrought at each level of production, distribution, and exhibition. If the sound cinema was not an entirely new medium, it certainly took a different institutional form. Like other new media developments Lisa Gilderman has charted, the sound cinema encouraged changes in both habits of public participation and related technical and economic structures. 
By integrating and stabilising the soundtrack, Sound Cinema radically standardised film performance. This turned film into a tight, highly constructed audiovisual experience that was now consistent, self-contained and self-sufficient. As a delimited and defined object screened in increasingly cinema-only theatre programs, the Sound Cinema provided a common film experience that, unlike the silent film, was significantly independent of the time, place and circumstance of a film screening. In place of the cinema event of the silent period with its screening plus live performance, there is now a stable film text consistently project and received through its outer films dissemination. Cinema screenings were now rendered more equivalent, whether in national or international circulation. Definitively separate from the theatre, the cinema was now a rival to the live performance itself, rather than the rival performance outlet it was earlier. Whereas the silent film theorists bracketed out films oral accompaniments, seeing them as distractions, the new electrical cinema, as it was known, made sound central to the cinema, its marketing and eventually its criticism. This new electrical cinema embraced a kind of sound reproduction which in being largely reverberation free, hence the, the curtains that were put up in cinemas, was clear, direct and easy to understand, and the carpets and the upholstery on the seats. This modern sound was a cornerstone of the various electroacoustic devices upon which sound in the cinema was based, the microphone, the amplifier and the loudspeaker. And this one best sound could also be found in the phonograph, the radio, the loudspeaker and the telephone. And indeed it was the same companies providing the equipment. This was a different sound than that of the music halls, skating rinks and initial purpose-built cinema venues of the silent cinema's first appearance. Those original screening and live performance venues had their own acoustic signature, representing the unique character, for better or worse, of the space in which it was heard. But as just as the sound film itself eliminated the effects of space for its geographically dispersed audiences by creating an invariant audiovisual text, so too the places for the projection and amplification of this sound, the cinemas themselves, became likewise space independent. Through their wiring for sound and theatre modifications to seating, air conditioning, walls and ceilings, carpeting, projection and amplification for the recorded sound and image, cinema venues became to more closely resemble each other in sound and projection. While variations persisted, these variations were now relatively minor compared to those in operation previously. The sounds that were reproduced which were increasingly also present in venues not requiring amplification, no longer had anything to say about the places in which it was produced and consumed, as Emma Thompson says. These remodellings enabled the industry to signal the sound cinema's enhanced status. When coupled with the claims for cinema excellence and art accompanying the development of the Academy Awards in 1929, cinema had entered into a new economy of prestige. The combination of higher filmmaking budgets for what were now mostly studio-based productions and the significant transformation of the conditions of viewing encouraged the further identification of the cinema with high-quality entertainment. The sound film required more directional, focused and attentive listening on the part of its audience, certainly not the behaviour of those women in the back row in the Smith's draw cartoon drawing you see on the screen. With film audiences now needing to comprehend dialogue and listen closely for sound, cues, for sound cues, listen closely for sound cues, the audience needed to learn to view the cinema silently. And this was a far cry from the hum of the conversing audience Rachel Lindsay spoke about, that had characterised much silent cinema viewing with its forms of attention initially modelled on variety and vaudeville forms of attention and interaction with the performance and audiences, performance, performance and performance. Even the kinds of snack eaten during film screenings changed as peanuts in shell gave way to popcorn and shelled peanuts. Talking was now increasingly confined to before and after a film's viewing, creating another, another condition for extended film reviewing. With the sound film becoming its own self-contained and complete object, the cinema program was now more like a book, magazine, newspaper or radio program. Like this, it promised, like them, it promised to be the same everywhere. Now institutionalised as a finished, complete and sometimes prestigious product projected in cinemas especially wide and acoustically treated for sound, the newspaper and periodicals interest in the cinema took a new turn. 
its long-standing twinning of twin marketing and publicity functions with independent commentary on and about films and filming led editors of general interest publications to partly decouple their newspaper cinema and theatre coverage, recognising their increasing separation, and to appoint named critics. They did so with a view to have, have them provide a more explicit guide for, film, for readers focused on the sound and images of the new films in release. And I'll finish just now. Film writing moved over the 1930s 30s, towards a more explicit, critical and evaluative focus, focused in film reviewing by often, but not always, named critics. These critics' task was to, in Alistair Cook's words, pick out the kind of movies and say roughly what they had on offer of the 650 feature films it was physically possible to see in Britain's major cities in each year. This established the office of the film critic in a new way, providing film fertile ground for film reviewing to approach cinema as its own discrete and distinct cultural and aesthetic form. Commenting on 1938 on the previous 10 short years of this new kind of film critic's existence, Cook suggested that, for the newspaper editor at least, the film reviewer could be best thought of as a sort of a crossbreed between a dramatic critic and a motor correspondent. This analogy alludes to the tensions between the industry publicity machine and independent critical review. In being not quite a drama critic and somewhat akin to a motor correspondent, where studios like motor manufacturers brought out new models with various attributes and affordances marketed as selling points on a seasonal basis, this disparaging estimation of what management wanted from its film reviewers points to the film reviewer operating on a contingent journalistic plane appropriate to a journalism beat, in this case, the film beat. The film critic undertook a more segmented by film title and modularised reviews only with occasional long feature articles task. So what I'm trying to get from this is that those different moments create the possibility for the extended film review. And what I wanted to emphasise within that is that, that this, while we tend to tell a story of the development of film criticism and film reviewing, that tends to focus on the achievements of the, of, of the writing and the extended criticism in books like Rachel Lindsay and, um, and Hugo Munsterberg and going into the kind of work of Iris Barry and, and um, film as art of Arnheim's and Rother's film till now, that if we want to understand the emergence of an extended film reviewing um, taken up in newspapers and periodicals, we, 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 we have to see these as not just responses to that development, and we have to see them as responses to the development of the, the nature of how newspapers and periodicals are, periodicals are taking up films and thinking about films, and newspaper editors are thinking about films, and thinking about the relationship of, the, of, the, of print and the cinema, and the symbiotic relationship between the two of those, and that they are kind of very important, more important arguably, in the formation of the film critics and film reviewers that emerge. It's quite notable, for instance, if we think of the kind of, um, of if we think of the importance of literary journalism as a, as a distinct form which had been improvised and was well established, in fact, by the late 18th, late 18th century, in fact, in, uh, in book reviewing publications, then we, we, we can see that this, is, this, was not a, this was not a hard move for a Carl Sandburg to make in the 1920s, just as was not a, a large um, step for a Josephine O'Neill, who graduated from the University of Targo in English in 1927, to become Australia's leading film reviewer in the 50s and 60s. And neither was it hard for Beatrice Tildesley, a Cambridge graduate who went to Cambridge in the um, early years of the 20th century, the first decade of the 20th century, and who became Women's Weekly's first film critic, alongside being at the same time a drama critic, an art critic, a theatre critic, a stalwart of the, of the independent uh, theatre movement, and a public affairs commentary uh, commentator writing for, for um, significant events and, and uh, mobilising in, in favour of various uh, women's interests, women's priority, um, so sort of first wave feminist, basically. Um, so, so it's it's th these kinds of configurations are just as important, it seems to me, to understanding how film extended film reviewing kind of works and how you get an Agi coming into it, or indeed a Sylvia Lawson, who's a Sydney University. 
English graduate in the 1950s, or a Megan Morris, who was a Sydney University French graduate in the 1970s, coming into kind of being working in film reviewing in the extended film reviewing space. This doesn't mean, of course, that the writings of Eisenstein and the writings of all of those people that are dear to us aren't important. It's just noting the ways in which they are one among a number of sort of uh, flow throughs that create the conditions under which the um, film reviewing could become extended film reviewing in a standard uh, and developed form. Thanks.